Hello, I'm Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society, and we're based in the Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. area. And today, um, we are here speaking with Laura Erickson, and this is in anticipation of the Sunday, December 13th, uh, author speaker program that WCAS hosts every month. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction, and then we're going to scan the camera over to Laura so she can tell us much, much more. So uh, on December 13th, Laura Erickson, the author of The Love Lives of Birds, Courting and Mating Rituals, is going to be with us speaking about herself, her work, and her, uh, her various books. So if I may, I would like to just give you a quick introduction to Laura, who I think you'll find really fascinating. So Laura Erickson is a 2014 recipient of the American Birding Association's prestigious Roger Tory Peterson Award, uh, has been a scientist, a teacher, a writer, a wildlife rehabilitator, professional blogger, public speaker, photographer, American Robin and Whooping Crane expert for the popular Journey North educational website, and even science editor at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Laura has written 12 books about birds, including in 2020, The Love Lives of Birds, and also the ABA Field Guide to the Birds of Minnesota, National Geographic Pocket Guide to Birds of North America, the best-selling Into the Nest, Intimate Views of the Courting, Parenting, and Family Lives of Familiar Birds, and that is co-authored by photographer Marie Reed, and the National Outdoor Book Award-winning Sharing the Wonder of Birds with Kids, 100 way, 101 Ways to Help Birds, and the Bird Watching Answer Book, for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So Laura is currently a columnist and contributing editor for Birdwatching Magazine. And since 1986, she's been producing the long-running For the Birds radio program for many public radio stations. And the program is podcast on iTunes. So Laura now joins us today from Duluth, Minnesota, Hello and welcome, Laura. We're so excited to meet you and please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and tell us what we need to know about this wonderful new book, The Love Lives of Birds, Courting and Mating Rituals. Well, I'm delighted to be here. One of the highlights of many years is in spring coming to Ohio bird watching during the biggest week. And I have a good friend in your neck of the woods, uh, Paula Lozano. So I love to go birding in Ohio down in the tropics compared to Minnesota, <laughs> compared to Northern Minnesota. You guys are the tropics, <laughs> but, um, I don't know what you want to know about me. I started out as a child, didn't know anything about birds. I grew up in Chicago. And um, so I knew pigeons and house sparrows. House sparrows I could identify by sound because they cheeped outside my window. I saw a blue jay in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is where Chicagoans often go to vacation. And I knew I must be in true wilderness to see that blue jay. It was amazing. Uh, I was, I think, five at the time. And I became a bird watcher in college. My husband told his mom to buy me binoculars and a field guide for Christmas, and I became totally, uh, not just committed, addicted. What a nice story. Um, do you remember how you, you initially became intrigued by birds by any chance? I'm always curious about 
what is it that finally, you know, catalyzes the interest and the curiosity of in nature about about birds? Well, I do remember we lived in Chicago until I was four, and I would stand on our sofa in the living room. We were in a, a two-flat apartment, and we were in the downstairs apartment, and I could look out the window and see the pigeons on the sidewalk and on the street, and I could see and hear the house sparrows in the bushes right by the window, and I was fascinated by them. And every time the pigeons flew up, if the windows were open, you could hear their wings clap, and it was so thrilling. Um, they, watching them fly brought my eyes up to the sky, and that was the only time I ever noticed the sky. My grandmother, who I have actual memories of, died when I was very little, and everybody told me she was in heaven. And that's where those birds were flying. So, of course, I, um, and her name was Laura, just like mine. And she had pet canaries and apparently always talked about birds and loved birds. And my grandpa gave me the little golden stamp book of birds. And that had a blue jay on the cover and a cardinal. And so I just loved birds as a very little child. And when I got the, uh, when I was in high school, I had a crush on this boy and I finagled a way to become his high school debate partner. And that meant I had to do really well in debate so he wouldn't hate my guts for screwing up and making us lose. So I would go to downtown Chicago to the public library a lot on weekends on Saturdays. And one Saturday, this was down in the loop, I found a dead bird on the sidewalk. And I picked it up and it was tiny and so beautiful. It had this olivey brown back, this black spots on a snow white breast, white rings around the eyes, an orange crown, and black around that, and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea that at the very place I was headed to, right that moment, there were books that could have told me what it was. I had no clue there was such a thing as a field guide. And all I could do is go into a McDonald's and get some napkins to wrap up the poor thing and put it in a garbage can, and I felt so sad. But a, a few years later, I married my debate partner, and when he told his mom to buy me a field guide and binoculars for Christmas, I opened the field guide to the oven bird. And it was like, whoa, every feature of that bird was impressed on my brain. And there it was, right there, and the map showed Chicago right where you could find them. And I always call that my Helen Keller at the pump moment, when I suddenly knew that I could find out the names of birds, and it was thrilling. So now that you asked, yes, I do remember. <laughs> wow, what a story. Well, I guess what I really am intrigued by about you, and I so in respect, is how, um, you know, how you have uh, follow, obviously followed your passions, your brilliance, and connected all of these fascinating areas in the realm of ornithology. You, you know, you've written stories. You've, um, you would imagine, I would imagine, taken many deep dives into the science of ornithology. Um, you've taught. You've taught others. You've written the stories, as I mentioned. You've done the caring um, of of birds. So, and not to mention an, an oodles of other things. But so, I just, I really, I love that totally holistic. You've embraced this holistic view uh, of of your interests and your passions through all these various categories, you know, or realms of information uh, in ornithology. So my hat's off to you. 
um, that's that's a very very cool to me. So I was me, very yeah. I was very lucky as a child. I went to a Catholic school, okay. and all our teachers were nuns. Not one of them got paid. They had all taken a vow of poverty, and my goal in life was to become a nun. And so I never ever had a mindset that people and what we did with our lives were measured by income. And my husband and I went to college. We were freshmen during the first Earth Day. And we were at different colleges, but I noticed right off the bat, professors were feeding us important information that we could present, but we absolutely could not say where we got the information because the professors were counting on grants from some of the biggest polluters. And when my husband and I kind of talked over this before we even got married, we decided that if he could get a job that was doing something worthwhile, and his dream was what he ended up doing, being a scientist at the EPA, then I would be the stay-at-home mom, and I would never have to get a job so I could speak truth to power without anyone censoring me. Wow. And so, so um, not making an income at what I've done has worked out fine and given me a freedom to look at things the way I needed to. When I was the stay-at-home mom, that's when I was a wildlife rehabber. And um, that's when I started getting skills in avian physiology that led to my uh, tr um, tragically short, uh, short-ended PhD program. My professor developed Alzheimer's. But I, believe it or not, was the world authority on Nighthawk digestion. <laughs> Wow. Well, I believe it. It's isn't it fascinating about the times that we that we live through, and how they you know how they affect us, how they help to shape our journey, um, and and what we do. So you had the freedom at that time when uh, when you were raising children of and caretaking the family. To I uh, would assume to act very entrepreneurially, as you said, speak be in the position to speak truth to power, and um, so I I now learned that you are an amazing forerunner, front runner to all that goes on today um, in our our um, the need for powerful advocacy to um, campaign for uh, environmental rights and uh, access and equality. So, wow, well, that's so awesome. I really find that fascinating. Um, so, um, it could, you know, I have one other question. So, so um, I see that your, you know, your mental breadth, your imagination has, has experienced few boundaries, I'm sure. And, and so we are the fortunate recipients of all of your creativity having done that. But on a physical level or a geographic level, um, have, has your work brought you to different places uh, on the planet? Um, have you traveled and, uh, or can you, is there, can you tell us about your experiences if you have some there? Uh, yeah, uh, being someone who didn't care about earning a living has limited our income because we've always lived on my husband's income and we had three children which paying college and everything limited the amount of money available for travel but I still did some traveling on our own money I've been to Costa Rica and Cuba and Ecuador paying my own way, but I've also been invited on what they call FAM tours, where I got to go to places sponsored by the government promoting tourism and especially ecotourism and making people aware of the amazing birds and wildlife to help these countries have a financial reason to protect 
birds and other wildlife. So I've been to Peru and um, Uganda. Uh, when I went to, I went to Mexico as part of a, um, when the American Ornithologist Union held their meeting down in on the Yucatan Peninsula. And I've been to Panama. Um, my husband sent me there. And I had a heart attack back in 2015. And I had been blathering about this adorable bird, the Cuban toady, for years. If you Google most adorable bird in the universe, it almost always takes you to my website first because I've always that's how I've always called the Cuban toady. And I'd never, ever had a chance to see it. And when I had my heart attack, we're driving, to, my husband's driving me to the hospital. I'm thinking, because my dad killed over of a heart attack dead when he was 50. And so I figured, well, I might, I'm certainly going to try to make it, but I might not. But boy, I've had such a happy life. And I thought about my children. I thought about all the cool birds I'd seen. I never once thought about anything I hadn't done. But all my poor husband could think was, oh my God, what if she dies and she's never seen a Cuban toady? So fortunately, this was during the Obama administration when we'd opened up travel to Cuba. And so the first time after I was all better that he heard of a trip to Cuba, he sent me there. <laughs> And I got to see my Cuban toady. <laughs> oh, that's such and a I've been to Europe story. once, but oh, not but just for a few days. And it was mainly in um, uh, in Germany. But we went on a, a, a side trip to Hungary and Austria, but not into the mountains or anything. But I saw some birds there too. That was for Zeiss. Wow! So cool. Very, very cool. That's so awesome. Um, so I, I want to ask you, you know, we're delighted to have you come and speak uh, Sunday, December 13th, uh, 2020, for, for the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society's book author interview and Q&A. And so, Laura, you're going to be telling us about um, your new book, The Love Lives of Birds, Courting and Mating Rituals. Can you tell us just a sneak preview about what that what you're going to be talking about and maybe just a tiny bit about the book? Um, how did how were you inspired to write that? Um, what are some things that we need to pay attention to? And and of course, could you please start with where people can purchase the book? So uh, the book should be available just about everywhere now. It's been um, okay. it was released in October. Oh, and okay. and so it's available both online and online stores, but also it should be in most bookstores now. And if it's not there at your favorite independent bookstore, you can order it. Uh, it was published by Story, which is a division of Workmen, so it's a big publisher. I wrote a book for them back in, I think, 2013. It was the year I was doing my big year called um, uh, Into the Nest, and that was with Mari Reed. She's an amazing photographer, so she was the photo editor, but so much of the book was so, the, the pictures were so integral to anything about the book that I said she had to be the co-author. But that book, um, I got to, uh, for some reason, back a long time ago in the 90s, I think, I or even the 80s. No, it was um, no, it was the 90s. I wrote my book, sharing the, uh, the wonder of birds with kids. And one of the things I remembered clearly was having given a program in a nursing home. And at the end of my program, the sweet little tiny woman in a wheelchair tentatively raises her hand. And she says, for 87 years, I have wondered something. How do birds, how do they, well, 
you know, how do they do it? And so I explained about bird sex to her, and I decided that most people don't, we call it the birds and the bees, but most people don't know what either birds or bees do to make new little birds and bees. So I decided to explain that very clearly in my book, Sharing the Wonder of Birds with Kids, for teachers and naturalists to know how to answer questions. Um, and the Duluth Public Library, uh, one of the, re um, the research librarians um, asked me, called me up to ask me where she could find out how birds do it, and I told her my book. And after that, she started calling me the Dr. Ruth of ornithology. And so I had to live up to that. So when I wrote um, Into the Nest, that gets a lot into the biology of how birds do it and how the, how the egg is formed and the female and everything. Uh, that book was very sciencey. Uh, the love lives of birds, they wanted something very lighthearted and they just wanted me uh, to write about 35 birds, and part of them were birds they chose, and part were ones I chose. And they wanted it to be a fun, but very accurate book about romance in the bird world. So that's what I gave them. I decided house wrens are literally, they, males just find every, new house they can in their little territory. So they're literally Casanovas. And um, black-capped chickadees are so proper. They have very strict social hierarchies for the males and females and always made across. And they're very uh, not public in their affection. And they reminded me of Jane Austen. And so my section about chickadees depends heavily on Jane Austen. And it was just a really fun book to write because I got to come up with a lot of fun things about birds and their love lives. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. And I know now that we know you a little better, we know that it's going to be very fascinating, but also based in science. Um, because of your holistic view, drawing from science, and but but the the larger you know birds within the larger scheme of of the environment and and the storytelling as well. So well, thank you for that. Is there anything else you'd like us to know as we an anticipate uh, our December program? Uh, if you've ever watched any of the Thin Man movies with mm -hmm. William Powell and Myrna Loy, that features prominently in my American Crow section. So if one of those movies is showing up on Turner Classic Movies in the coming <laughs> weeks, people might want to watch one um, and think about crows. Um, Kevin McGowan, who is a, a wonderful scientist at the Cornell Lab, is also probably the world authority on American crows. And so I passed the chapter I wrote about crows to him, and he gave me a really funny story about um, a, a, a female crow who did not live up to the Myrna Loy uh, archetype. Oh, well, we're really looking forward to seeing you and, and coming to the program on Sunday, December 13th, to talk about your wonderful new book, The Love Lives of Birds, Courting and Mating Rituals. And uh, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in December. Thank you so much for having me.